Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, I think we're uh, ready to get started uh, with this webinar. Um, so this is hosted by uh, CCS, um, Central Confinement Services out of Columbus, Nebraska, and also um, uh, Protein Processing Services, uh, which we are a member of. Um, so I just want to give you a little introduction to Protein Processing Services. Uh, we're a group of, um, of four companies that got together to uh, uh, service the uh, food processing industry. And um, we, can, we can do everything from the very beginning to the end. If you're thinking about a new facility or upgrading um, uh, what you currently have. So uh, we do feasibility studies. Uh, we do business planning, um, site evaluation, permitting, um, and working through both state and local entities uh, for the site. Um, we do facilities design uh, from uh, large to small. And then, um, then we can wrap that up with construction too. And uh, so uh, do a turnkey all the way from the concept to the end. And uh, we'll give, give you a little contact information on the back end of this if, uh, if you'd like to talk to us. Um, but this uh, webinar is gonna be focused on insurance um, for processing facilities. We've got a great guest today, uh, Cole Williams from Insurance Associates in Norfolk, Nebraska. And uh, Cole, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, like, like Steve said, my name is Cole Williams. I'm with Insurance Associates in Norfolk, Nebraska. Um, our agency has been working with a um, variety of size meat processors since um, for about 35 years now. And um, myself, I've been with the agency coming up on 12 years. Actually, in, uh, tomorrow it'll be 12 years that I've been with the agency. And in that time, I've only worked with meat and food processing plants. Um, I was, uh, in my, in my conversations with Hannah and, and Steve just a little bit ago, um, I was, I was asked to participate in this just to kind of shine some light on, you know, some of the basics that, um, that processors should be looking at when they, um, when they're, when they're looking at building a new plant or expanding, um, their facility and, um, and just mainly because there's been so much growth in this industry, um, you know, in, in the last, you know, in the last, you know, nine months since the pandemic started, certainly. Um, but this industry has been booming for the last, um, the last, uh, well, I, I want to say probably five to seven years. Um, we've seen, you know, the, the processors that have made it, you know, through the contraction of the economy doing really well. Um, and so as a result of that, um, that growth, we were forced to somewhat tailor our experience and our skill set um, to match the needs of this, this evolving industry. Um, so I'm going to, I know this is everybody's favorite topic is, in, is insurance and it's, uh, it's super fun to talk about. Um, but, um, you know, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to just give some basics a little more. I'm going to start with some of the basics talk about some of the more advanced type coverages and then and then give you some some proactive methods how to control your costs on the back end um, but you know so if, if you have any questions you know while I'm in you know we're gonna we have a chat function that we can ask questions at the end um, but if you have any questions while I'm talking about it just you know raise your hand or unmute yourself or you know whatever and and I'll try to address them as best I can um, you know, in our in our experience in the industry, we've seen a lot of new facilities enter the market, and the key challenge that we've identified that a lot of the, a lot of processors face, large or small, is um, is maintaining access to uh, to capital while not outpacing your appetite to take risk. Um, that's that applies to new businesses and growing businesses, but it also applies to just small businesses in general, right? How much risk can you take on and how much capital do you have to grow? Um, and so what we found is that oftentimes um, when a company is in that growth mode, they there's often um, the, the, the attention to somewhat simple risk management techniques 
and you know very available policy language gets ignored. It's not the fault of the processor because you know you guys are in this business to to, to butcher and process animals and 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 feed you know feed your local communities. Um, but we find it's more on the uh, you know inattention of the broker or the insurance agent that maybe just you know, by no fault of their own, just doesn't have a ton of experience in this industry. Um, so today, you know, I want to talk about how to maintain that healthy balance of how to utilize your insurance um, and your insurance agent as a vital business asset, such that by doing that, you can you can grow safely without fear of the unknown. So um, show of hands, uh, does everybody, is everybody currently involved in the meat industry or, or are we grow or, you know, building new plants? Just kind of, kind of give me a background on what everybody's, what everybody's position is at, at, at this point. Who's grow or who's building a new facility? Jason. All right. Um, so some of the things that, that you should really, you know, be paying attention to, um, like I said, there, there's just, there's some real simple and basic things like, you know, you need, you need property insurance, liability, workers' compensation. Um, everybody, everybody somewhat knows that just from a, from a basic level. Um, but when we look at, you know, when we look at insuring, you know, a meat processing plant for, you know, for property insurance, there's a couple things that you really need to focus on. Um, the first one is obviously your building. Um, uh, Steve, you can probably attest to this a little bit um, when we're talking about the cost per square foot, but depending on the size of the facility, I mean, you could be looking at any, anywhere from 250 bucks a square foot uh, all the way up to 400, depending on the the advanced uh, scale of things. So, um, Steve, what are you what are you guys seeing on on average right now? Um, you know, say a 10,000 square foot building. What are you looking at per square? Yeah, foot? I think you're you're very close. It depends on the equipment and things like that, but right. um, it, it would not be it wouldn't be too tough to get into that 400 to 450 um, right. range with um, you know all, all new. Right, and so the the reason I bring that up is. Um, when we're talking about, you know, when Steve says it depends on the equipment, you know, you got to, it's important to understand that your building isn't just, you know, the physical structure. Uh, what's including it, included in your building insurance is all of the, you know, permanently attached equipment, which would include coolers, freezers, rail systems, um, you know, further processing equipment like smoke houses, um, cure rooms, you know, whatever, whatever sort of business you're in. Um, all those things really have to be included in the cost of the building. And sometimes when I tell somebody that their building's underinsured by, you know, a hundred percent, they, they think I'm crazy. And when you start to add it all up, you know, it, it, it really, it really adds out there, adds up there. And so one of the reasons that we do that is number one is the policy language often just reads that way. Um, but the other thing is, and this is an efficiency that, that you can utilize, you know, to your advantage is that nine times out of 10, uh, building rates are less expensive than, than personal property or contents rates. Um, so the more, you know, the more that we can get into, you know, included in the building price and the building valuation, um, not only are you following, you know, what's written in the policy, but you're also getting efficiencies because the rates are, the rates are a lot less. Um, the second thing you know that we that we talk about with um, with with property is your is your business personal property. Um, so that would be you know your machinery, basically anything that's not attached. And again, this is something that we see a lot that that people don't people don't pay a whole lot of attention to. But um, and depending on you know depending on the size of your operation, this could go this could go different ways. But you know, if you have if you have a roll stock machine or a vacuum packaging machine, it's not uncommon to have you know you know ten to fifteen bolts of you know of just plastic that you have on hand, and that plastic you know depending on you know whether it's uh, multi layer lamination or if it's just you know just basic you know packaging for for primals or whatever, I mean those those bolts of packaging could go you know two three thousand dollars a piece. And so when you look around your facility and you think, well, I've got a bandsaw or I've got a bunch of bandsaws and I've got this packaging machine, 
you can see all that stuff that's in front of you. Um, but all the other stuff, the cardboard, the plastic, the, you know, the spices, if you're doing value added stuff, I mean, all those stuff really start to add up. So our recommendation is, is two things is first, when we look at it, when we look at an existing business or even, or even a new business is we want to look at your, you know, uh, or we don't, ha- we don't necessarily have to, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good basis point is to look at your depreciation schedule that you're going to use for your taxes. That should give you a list of the, the majority of the equipment that you have in your facility. And from there we can say whether that's building or this, that, or the other. Um, so that'll, that'll give you a good list. And then from there, it's, it becomes important to work with, you know, whoever your equipment supplier is or, you know, or somebody like myself who's been around the industry to have a, get a good basis point for what that stuff's going to cost if you were going to buy it brand new. Um, and then the, the last, the last kind of the, the big kicker on, as on the, on the, the property insurance is depending on, um, Jason, are you going to be a custom shop? Custom, you know, custom processing butcher shop. Okay. Um, and um, Michael, are you guys, are you custom as well? There you are. We do, we do custom and we do some retail stuff as well. So, okay. Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Is, uh, no, I and I'm, I'm also an a insurance agent in Wyoming here. And oh, nice. so I'm just trying to get it a different perspective on everything. So sure. Um, there's some new plants being built out your way. Um, yes. Uh, Riverton. And then um, where's the other one? And um, was Laramie? Yeah. Laramie's open and running. They, they started, uh, I think in March. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yep. Kelsey is that guy's name. Any, yep. Anyways. Yeah. Well, a- anyways, the, um, the point, the point that I'm trying to make is that, um, you you're as in your in your operation you're going to have a certain amount of customers meets that's that's hanging in your coolers and you can have you could have it from all the way from hanging all the way to waiting to be picked up and it's not outside the realm of possibility that if you're going to be doing you know 10 or 15 beef a week whatever you know and you know 20 hogs or whatever the deal is it's not uncommon to have up to six weeks worth of other people's inventory sitting in your facility Um, so you really need to make sure that you have specific property of others coverage, um, that's with a limit attached to it. You can't just, you can't just rely on it being in the policy form. Um, you got to have it scheduled. Otherwise there's no coverage for it. And the the basic, you know, the basic understanding of the basic premises that this is not your stuff. Your customers are charging you a fee to kill their animals and turn them into, and to turn them into product. And, um, and that are going to, you know, it's going to feed your local community. So you you really need to make sure that that, that that critical asset is insured Um, because, you know, the reason you buy insurance is so that the sun rises tomorrow. And the best way to ensure that the sun rises after a major loss is to be able to walk in, bring all your customers in and say, look, we've got all your stuff covered. It's going to take a little bit of time to get your checks, but we're, we've, we've got insurance for it. Um, I'm going to touch on business income in a little bit, but, um, so those are some, just some of the basics of, you know, property coverage, um, liability coverage, uh, people s- tend to spend a little more time talking about this than maybe, than maybe should. Um, and I find that when, when an agent is maybe dabbling in something that they don't, uh, have a ton of experience in, um, but for the sake of the conversation, you know, liability coverage is a third party coverage that, that defends you and then pays for, losses related to bodily injury and property damage arising out of your operations or your premises. So main thing is, you know, think about it as somebody trips and falls in your plant or, you know, walking into your plant or in your retail store, that's a premises liability claim. If somebody gets sick from your operations, that'd be a bodily injury, you know, operations claim. Um, An interesting tidbit from our perspective is that we have never had a single bodily injury claim come from a small locker plant. Um, and that's that's good leverage that we have to run our specific program um, for you know small and medium sized processors um, that we that we utilize to secure attractive rates and in broad coverage. Um, 
the last piece is uh, is workers' compensation. Um, again, this is another third party coverage that is going to pay um, your employees um, for their injuries and then lost time um, in the event of uh, a, an injury sustained at work. Um, there's a lot of nuance to this coverage and I can talk about it um, a little bit later, but more importantly, that those, those three coverages, property, liability, work comp, those are gonna be the bulk of the coverages you're gonna deal with um, you know, as, it, as it relates to your day-to-day -day operations. Um, any questions on any of this so far? Anybody? I do. What's up? You said you don't, uh, you didn't have any claims on bodily injury. How many plants do you have insured? Uh, we, we currently insure, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 meat processing plants. Impressive. Now I'm not saying that that's none of them. You know, because there are some larger facilities that are doing bulk, you know, ground beef, stuff like that. And you're going to have little pieces of bone and stuff in there every now and then you have a chipped tooth. But for the small locker plants that we insure, you know, and I consider a small locker anywhere from, you know, five to 25 employees. Um, yeah, we've never had anybody get any like a foodborne illness or anything arising out of their operations. And, and that and it makes sense because you're not killing at such a high volume. You're able to keep, you know, cross contamination, you know, to, you know, to a low level. And, uh, and those animals are, are being cared for um, in, a, in a better manner um, when you don't have to when you don't have to gut, um, you know, a thousand beef a day and you're only doing, you know, 10 to 15 a week, you're, you're going to have more time to spend making sure that the eviscera gets out, that you're not, you know, you know, cutting the, the intestines and spreading fecal matter. I mean, that, that's how most of that stuff gets introduced, but um, that's just, you know, it's kind of an odd thing. I'd like to take credit for it, but I think it's just the industry uh, that, you know, of this, the nature of the small locker. Um, some of the other, you know, some of the other advanced, you know, these aren't advanced coverage. This is just, you know, if, if property liability and work comp were, were schedule one coverage then schedule one B coverage would be things like, you know, getting, um, getting, uh, whatever limit is available to you for food contamination. Um, and I'm not talking about product recall necessarily. That's its whole, that's a whole other animal. Um, but food contamination, there's, there's starting to be some, um, some more coverage forms that are available out there. Um, and the, the catch 22 on food contamination is that the, the coverage form, if anybody comes to you and says, I have limited withdrawal coverage, you want to say, I'm not paying for that because that coverage isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Because the way that that policy form reads is that the only way that the coverage is going to be triggered is if it's released to the public. But if your food safety system is working the way it should, it should never release to the public. So the only way to collect on it would in essence to be to commit insurance fraud. In, a, in, a, in other words, you know it's contaminated, you release it, so you get the coverage for it. So that's why you want to get food contamination coverage because that will cover, you know, your your loss of product um, that you can't sell or you have to sell at a diminished value um, for for you know meat and food that's in that's in your facility. Um, the other thing that you want to really pay attention to is spoilage coverage um, and equipment breakdown and. You know, when you're when you're going through your policy or you're sitting down with your agent, whoever it is, and you're you're actually analyzing, you know, what's your you know, what's your inventory value going to be? You really want to match your spoilage limit to that inventory value. Um, if you're going to ensure that inventory for a fire, you know, which is probably fairly unlikely to happen, um, it only makes sense to ensure it for something that's more likely to happen, which is spoilage from, you know, from a, a breakdown of your compressor or change in temperature. Um, those, th that's, you know, that, that, that's a, that's a big one is just to make sure that those coverage limits match. Um, and, and the other thing is to keep in mind that spoilage isn't just, isn't just, um, equipment breakdown and spoilage are different. Spoilage happens often as a, re as a result of equipment breakdowns. Um, but changes in temperature is, is a spoil is spoiled. Uh, so we've had, you know, we've had total loss fires where, where the um, 
where actually some of the inventory was was uh, was paid for as a result of their spoilage policy because it was it was spoiled. There's a change in temperature. Um, same goes if you have, um, and then the big reason for this is that most fires aren't going to burn down a brand new building. Um, but if you have a fire in a meat plant and you have and you have goods that are unpackaged, like carcasses hanging, um, your inspector is going to condemn all those. So again, it's it's one of those things where where you need to you need to you need to match those up um, so that they're that they're similar. Um, the last the, probably the last you know main you know main coverage that we really drill down on a lot is off-premises power failure or utility services interruption. Um, basically, that's going to that's gonna be, you know, we've all been in Midwestern snowstorms where, um, or tornadoes or whatever the deal is, where it knocks down power lines. And, you know, we're all just sitting in our house, freezing our butts off, um, you know, waiting for the power to turn back on. Um, at a, if you don't have utility services interruption, that includes overhead transmission lines. This is a big one that make sure that includes overhead transmission lines. Um, if you lose power to your facility, you're up the creek without a paddle. Now, every does everybody remember that that derecho uh, that storm that went through Iowa in, in in August? So we had we had probably 15 processing you know butcher shops over there and processing plants of all shapes and sizes lose power. And all they did was go rent a generator. And, and that is what this coverage that off-premises power failure encourages you to do is that you have income coverage to go rent a generator. And some of these were big ones. I mean, there was one that we had over there that had to bring in, um, it had to be brought in on a semi-trailer or on a, on a flatbed. It was one of those big, um, big cat, um, you know, generators. And, um, you know, that claim what we paid on that was about $80,000. But on the flip side of it is our carrier and any carrier is going to want to pay that 80 grand to avoid, you know, a three quarters of a million dollar spoilage claim, which is about the limit that we had on that policy. Um, so all those things, you can kind of see what I'm getting at is that these coverages aren't too terribly expensive to buy, but they're really expensive if you don't have them. And these are, this is like what I was talking about earlier is that these are just efficiencies that, that we've found that, that will, that will give you that long-term protection that enables you to grow without, you know, without having significant restraints on, on your capital, which is, which is a big deal. Um, the final coverage, the, the actual just coverage that I want to talk about is, uh, is business income coverage. Um, you know, we our our program that we write for ninety five percent of our butcher shops has um, it's called a business owner's policy, and so um, the the loss of income coverage is just automatically included. Um, so when you're looking at your your coverage forms and your policies, you, you you need to make sure that your loss of income is on there, and if it's not automatically available. You, you, your the barometer that we use for picking a limit on that is forty percent of your gross sales. So if your sales are a million bucks, you're going to want to buy at least four hundred thousand dollars of business income coverage. Um, because if your if your building is burnt down, this coverage is going to keep paying you for your continuing, um, not for your continuing expenses, but it's going to it's going to pay you for your loss of income during a period of restoration. That's a, that's kind of a kicker. Um, and it's what keeps people in business after, you know, after, after a major loss. Um, the last fire that we had was over in Iowa in, um, boy, it's five years ago by now, 2016. Um, and, you know, we, it was a small plant, you know, it was, it was 2,300 square feet, total loss, um, and that claim ended up being about $850,000 when it was all said and done because we paid them or not we, but the carrier, um, paid them about $300,000 or something in loss of income. And so not only does that pay you your loss of income, but if you, you need to get the ordinary payroll extension, uh, or the ordinary payroll wording, including included in that so that it continues to pay your, your employees. Um, 
while they're, you know, while the business is being rebuilt. Um, so those, I know it's kind of, I kind of rushed through a lot of that stuff. So does anybody, does anybody have any other questions about, you know, the, what, you know, some of those coverages that I, that I had just mentioned? Okay, cool. Can I, um, can I, yeah, hold up. Can I just go back over what you talked about? Yeah. So liability, workers comp, personal property, hazard, food contamination, spoilage, yep, lost power failure, and business income coverage. Yep. Is that all of them? I mean those those are those are the the bulk of the 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 really important coverages. And so there's they, more. Well, I mean there's um I mean, there's there's a handful of uh, there's a variety of other coverages that just that just get automatically included in a, in a policy. But these are going to be the ones that that you just mentioned that I talked about. Those are going to be the ones that really make or break your business, honestly. If if you if you have or don't have them, um, and um, and the one one I want to make sure that you get this written down is that on the the off premise power failure, make sure that it includes overhead transmission lines yep you know because if because a lot of them don't um you have to actually add that add that on but i mean like yeah like like i said that that's the bulk you know those are though that those those you know main coverages are going to be the bulk of the coverages that that you're going to need um to sustain a major loss if if in the event you were to have one now is that on the I don't know which one would fall under, but that would basically cover from when a producer delivers livestock until packaged is delivered to consumer or back to producer. Back to the producer. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're going to have, if, if you're going to be in the direct to consumer business, there's some additional change, you know, there's some additional more, maybe some more nuanced coverages that you need to deal with. Um, mainly because you're dealing with more of a more of a supply chain um than you are bricks and mortar but um you know i i can that that's a whole other webinar honestly um to talk about the nuance that's in the direct to consumer market but um you know since we're talking with with steve and and protein processing services i figured it was probably best just to focus on the bricks and mortar stuff well the reason i asked that is i I know a family that um, they produce locally in their community mm -hmm. and that locker plant burned down oh, and shoot. part of that insurance coverage, they only got, they had seven animals. I think it was like seven animals under that roof. Mm -hmm. Only got paid on two because of the way the insurance coverage was written. Some mm -hmm. animals were covered based on what process they were in and other oh, sure. animals didn't. So it was an economic loss for that producer. Yeah. Well, and, and like I said, I mean, that's, you know, your, your customers are what keep your business going. Right. And so, you know, like I said, it's, it's not, it's not out, outside the realm of possibility for, you know, like, you know, like the total loss fire that, that we, that I mentioned in 2016, you know, that, that was a 2,300 square foot building and we paid out $150,000 in, in personal property of others claims. It just doesn't take a lot for that stuff to add up, especially if you don't have people come pick them up right away. Um, and that's why you've, you've started to see a lot more recently of, you know, on people's websites where they start charging you a fee um, if you don't pick it up within the week and, um, you know, st just stuff like that. But um you know, we, we, we had all the customers lined up and we had, you know, we had plenty of coverage for them. Um, and they just started writing checks, you know, based on the number of the animals and the market conditions at the time. Yeah. They, they were told that, uh, you know, hanging is beef carcasses. So yeah. beef hanging was insured different than what was already packaged. And so they only got paid on part, which I thought was kind of a bogus thing. Now I got my guard up like, I, I don't want that. 
<laughs> well, and and that that's it's a it's a reasonable concern to have. And and I mean, you think about it. There are different. There are varying levels of, you know, of of coverage there. Um, but that's where, you know, if I want to say if that producer. And again, some of this is some of this is more nuanced because the producer is probably marketing those direct to consumers, or they have friends and family members that are buying them. Um, so not only do they need to be compensated for you know because when somebody buys a quarter of beef, they're buying the quarter of the animal, then they're paying the processor for for the butchering. Um, so depending on how that arrangement was set up, yeah, you do have you do have differing losses there where you have you know just say let's just call a beef, you know, um, two grand, you know, cause that's, if they had to go buy a new one, that's probably what, it, about what it would cost. Um, and then you've got to refund the, the processing fees on top of it. So what, with what, with what our customers did this, you know, when, when they had that fire is we paid everybody for their animals. Um, and then we, then there was, then there was credits that were applied, uh, for the processing and some of them took them in cash. Some of them took them in, well, I know you're going to be open in, you know, in a year or so. So, you know, I'll just bring my beef in and they, they negotiated stuff on the back end there. Um, their primary concern was just, um, making sure that they, that they were indemnified for the loss of the animal, which is like I said, two grand, 2,500, depending on the weight, you know, um, that kind of stuff. And we, we look at those as, as live weight, um, not, not on the, not on the rail weight. Um, when we're, when we're factoring that, because that's what we would have to go buy. If, if, if we ruin one of your beef or something like that, we got to go buy you a new, a new animal. And so that's what we're going to be paying you for is not, not per pound hanging weight, but per pound live weight. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, just the basics, the basics of the coverage. Um, I just want to give you guys uh, before we, before we wrap this up, I just want to give you guys a, a couple ways that you guys can be, be proactive um, to reduce your expenses. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, we've talked a lot about, like I said, the basics of the coverage and, and those are, those are how you're going to be efficient um, to make sure that your, that your, your, your risks are properly insured and that your capital can be utilized for growth. Um, but there's, there's, I've got five things that I think are, are beneficial that will help, um, help, you know, control your costs down the road. Um, the first one is, um, and I, and I, I had written this down, not as a plug, uh, for anybody, but really just to say, you want to invest in high quality equipment. And, uh, and you want to invest in somebody uh, to build your facility that has experience doing this kind of thing. Um, like Steve was saying earlier, they do engineering, they do environmental studies, they do your business planning, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that stuff that, that you're going you're gonna to pay for probably, I'm sure there's a charge for all those kinds of things, but what's your, what are your man hours worth um, when it comes to, um, and, and what's your, your experience worth when it comes to doing that kind of stuff? Um, so you're going to, you're going to invest and pay probably a little more top dollar, top dollar for, for the actual equipment in the building. Um, but what you're getting on the back end is a very tight building. That's, that's efficient and economically viable. And you have equipment that's going to be processing, you know, that's going to be high quality. Um, and it's going to minimize your, your product loss. Um, especially when it comes to packaging machines. I mean, and I, you know, I, some of my, some of my biggest customers that I talk to, I, I ask, you know, where'd you get your start? And they're like, well, we were, you know, we were, you know, 20 years ago, we were, we were killing, you know, five, 10 beef a week. And um, we were making snack sticks on the side and, you know, the snack stick business was really growing. And, and, uh, you know, so it's like, well, what was the difference? And it's always packaging because that's where your bottleneck is going to be. So my recommendation is to invest in packaging and um, packaging machinery and, and high quality grinders and stuffers. I can't say that enough. Um, I think the next webinar that, that you guys are having is actually with uh, one of my buddies who works at Ultrasource, uh, Derek Schroeder. And, um, and he'll, he, you know, he'll attest to that as well. It's, it'll save you guys um, lots of money on the back end. 
Um, number two, we kind of talked about this a little bit ago is buy business income coverage. I can't say it enough. Um, and it's not just for your loss of income. It's for the extra expenses. Like if you lose power and you have, you have an extra expense to run a generator, um, you got to have that stuff. It's just, it's just part of being a responsible business owner to make sure that your income stream is protected. Um, this one, the, the next one, and this, this is a workers comp related situation. Um, and, and so there's two parts of this is, um, if a worker, if a worker is, is injured, um, it is in your best interest to pay them their wages if they are out of work. Um, there's two factors to this one, the overall claim is less expensive. That's, you know, that's, that's a, a no brainer. Um, but number two, and more importantly, um, when you start talking about experience modifications and, and as it relates to workers' compensation, um, what you will pay in indemnity, which is lost wages, if your carrier pays for that, the overall claim, you'll pay more in premium over three years than the overall claim would be had you just paid them their lost wages. And there's a lot of nuance to that. And, and it, it's, it's kind of a, it's more of an art, not necessarily a science on how you, on how you, how you do that. Um, but as it relates to workers' compensation, if you only hear one thing from me today, it is pay your wages, pay, you pay your workers' wages if they're injured. Um, and so then the second part to that is in order to do that, you have to be intentional with your workplace safety manuals. Um, Every one of our customers has, we, we provide, um, we provide them with a workplace, uh, you know, like an actual meat or food packing, um, you know, workplace specific uh, safety manual. They get a return to work program, a uh, return to work policy. Um, so th those are, those are the two the you know, those are the, you know, two that go kind of hand in hand. Um, but then the other, the other two that go into this, that, we call the, the core four safety manual is you got to have a drug free workplace policy and you also have to have a post accident drug screening policy. It's just, it's just so th those, those four um, really make up the guts of a good, of a, of a good real basic, you know, safety manual. You can talk about employee incentives, um, you know, down the road, but um the, those, those won't, those won't make any difference if you don't have those, um, you know, the, that, those core four things at the start. And then the final thing is um, just report any claims of any size immediately. Um, the statistics on, especially as it relates to workers comp claims. Um, if you have a workers comp claim that's reported two weeks late, the cost of the, the cost of that claim is going to be 40% higher. Um, than it, what it would be had you reported it immediately. And the reason for that is investigation and uh, in due diligence on the part of the carrier. And then the other thing is that you're going to remember, you, since you're going to be paying their wages, it's going to decrease the amount of lost time that the carrier is going to have to pay on the back end, which is going to hurt you for three years down the road um, as it relates to your experience month. So, that's kind of my, you know, real high level overview. I mean, there's a lot of nuance that goes into a lot of these coverages, but I hope I explain them in a way that that's digestible and that, that, it, that you can employ in your own business. Um, if you guys have any questions for me, um, throw them in the chat box and I'll try to, we'll try to get through them. Um, but, um, you know, go ahead, Michael. Just real quick. Do you guys, um, represent just one carrier or do you shop or variety of carriers or how, how do you come up with your packages? We are, we're independent agents. Um, so we, we have a variety of different carriers. Um, our, we, we do have a proprietary program for what I would consider small to medium sized butcher shops. That's that five to 25 employees. Um, Beyond that, you just don't see many slaughter facilities that have more than 25. It's either there, it's either five to 25 or a hundred and above. I mean, that's, you know, there isn't really much in the middle there. Um, and if it's, if it's more than that, then, you know, then you have some middle market carriers that, that will take swings at that kind of stuff. So I don't know if that answers your question, but 
Um, we have about five different markets that we go to for the variety of different risks, whether it's slaughter related or not, whether it's ready to eat, you know, all those kinds of things really, really factor into it. So what all states do you guys, um, can you guys provide coverage in? Uh, are you guys what? nationwide or what? Um, we, we can, we can be nationwide. Um, you know, it's it, for us, it's, it's a, it's a matter of opportunity cost and, and cost of acquisition of new business. I mean, that's really mm-hmm. kind of our limiting factor. Um, but you know, we write, we write meat packing plants in 18 different States right now. So, um, the majority of them are in the Midwest. I'm in Norfolk, Nebraska. So, um, you know, it just kind of, it just kind of fits that this is in our, in our backyard that we don't, we don't have to go too far, but we have some in Texas, we have some in California, um, Pennsylvania. I mean, all those kinds of different places that were Washington that were active. Wyoming. Um, yeah. That's it. That's all I have. Michael, where are you from? We're uh, around Torrington, Wyoming, Hawk Springs, Wyoming, actually. 10-4. Hey, Cole, a uh, quick question on um, uh, insurance. Does it matter or are there any differences if you've got a uh, USDA facility or a non-USDA? In terms of, um, as it relates to my position, no, not really. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not really, it doesn't really make any difference to me. Um, now in terms of, uh, rebuilding, it does make a difference, especially if you have a grandfathered USDA facility. Um, there was one, there was one in Nebraska that burned down, um, eight years ago, um, and, um, and it was a really old building, but it was a USDA facility. And, um, I, I didn't insure it at the time. I just kind of was watching this from, you know, from the sidelines. Um, what the, the trouble that you run into is that you have to replace with like kind or quality. So you can't, you can't, you know, you're going to, you want to get paid to continue to be a USDA processor. So if you don't have, if you don't have that increased cost of construction, you know, sublimits or, or just insuring it for what the modern expense of a, you know, insuring it for the modern expense of a meat plant, you're going to be up the creek without a paddle. Now, this guy went into a, you know, he took, I don't remember what it was. It was, it was, I think it was 4,000 square feet or something like that. You know, probably should have had it insured for over a million dollars, and and it was an old downtown building. And you tell people that, and they're like, "You're crazy! You can't! This is, this isn't worth that much." And it's like, "Well, okay," but he, you know, he took that money and and built, you know, invested in a much larger facility. And I think, you know, I think that's the opportunity that 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 insurance brings is that you're you're gonna at bare minimum you're gonna replace we're gonna replace what you had. What you do with that is up to you. And what we see, like the last one that we had. Um, they rebuilt, um, into about 7,000 square feet and, and, uh, they were only into it for about 95, you know, I think because they built more, they had to put in about a hundred grand of their own money. Um, but they just sold it, you know, to a, a, a younger couple and came out ahead on the whole deal. So, you know, when people are talking about, well, I don't want to insure it that much. My, this isn't even anecdotal. This is like physical evidence is that an operating upgraded meat facility is worth way more than what your actual cash value settlement would be. If your building burned down, you just didn't replace it. You know, you're it's, it's two or three times that. So, yeah. Well, that's great. I know you've got to, uh, um, we need to wrap this up. Um, Cole, really appreciate all your experience and sharing some of, of those uh, tips with everybody. Well, thanks Uh, for having me. We'll also, uh, this will be recorded. And um, and I think uh, um, we're also have put up um, email addresses and phone numbers to um, to get a hold of uh, both Cole uh, on the insurance side and myself, Steve Becker um, on um, any any new or remodeled facilities. If you've got 
something you think uh, we could help you with, the protein processing services, um, be happy to talk to you anytime. So just feel free to, to give me a call. Um, and Cole, you're open for some phone calls if- um, Yeah, likewise, my, my phone number is 402-371-0792. Um, you can find us online at insuranceassociates.biz. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean, I, you, 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 you can find me out there. If you just Google Cole Williams meat processing, you ought to be able to find me one way or another. Okay. That sounds good. And I'll just, um, um, the, uh, email address or not email, but the website for protein processing services, it's protein, protein processing services.com. Or my phone number is 402-563-6049. So uh, unless there's a last minute question, we'll get this wrapped up. Um, don't see any. So uh, Cole, thank you very much. Um, Thanks guys. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, have a great rest of the day.